Business is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, hello, everyone, and happy, happy Publishing Day. I always think of uh, writing and publishing go hand in hand, of course. Books go hand in hand. Um, And that a lot of times people get caught, get stuck in the writing process. A lot of you know who have been listening recently that I actually did the entire first draft of my book in a week. Uh, my latest book, which is now available, so I did it at the uh, first week in February, had it fully gutted it, got it for the first round of editing. It had three rounds, but it is available, all 300 pages of it, a little book. And you can do that too, but it's all about the writing process and how you do it and find out how you go about doing it. What's the, your trigger points? What's your stuck points? And with us is an expert to help us get through all of that today. And Janza is an author herself. She's written The Writer's Process and The Workplace Writer's Process. So we're going to find out what the difference is between the two of them. But she's a multi-award winning indie author who comes from a background in business marketing. And, and I can't tell you how essential it is to understand that, especially when you're with someone who does any kind of coaching, because that when they get what it is to market, um, that you get much, um, much greater uh, and certainly fuller picture. She's, uh, Anne will tell you she's a self-confessed cognitive science geek. I love that. Um, which will surface in throughout our conversation today, uh, because we're going to be really talking about the ways that you too can fine tune your own writing process so that you're more creative, you're more productive, and better yet, you're both. So, with that, Anne, let's just kind of jump in here today. Great. Great. Welcome, welcome to Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing. So, thanks for having me. I love talking about books and publishing and writing. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah, me too. So, yeah, it's kind of in our DNA, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, how how did you get involved with books? I mean, were you always a book person? No, I wasn't. So, I spent most of my career um, working in marketing, as as you said, and and writing uh, often in the voice of the brand or or ghost writing blog posts, uh-huh. you know, short form stuff and papers, things for. Uh, corporate executives and things. Um, but I, I was re- inspired to write my first book, which was about, it's called Subscription Marketing, and it's about marketing and, and the relationship with the customer. Um, mm-hmm. And I was inspired to write that as kind of a, a manifesto, right, because I was seeing yeah. things that I wanted to communicate in the world. So that's what inspired me to write the first book, and that came out at the beginning of 2015. And, so that was um, originally called what? It, it's the writer's process now, right? Oh no! Oh, that was a different book. This is even pre-writer's process. This is called oh, subscription oh, 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 marketing. Oh. Yeah, got it, got yeah. it. Okay, I didn't even send you the information on that one because it's kind of for a, a marketing audience. Although, eh, you know, of course, I've learned as always, everything applies to book writing and book publishing as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I enjoyed writing that book so much uh, and learned so much in the process of writing and publishing that that I've you know, continue to write and publish a book a year since then. So I'm on book number four coming out this summer. So, And what's that book going to be? That book is about writing nonfiction. Um, so the writer's process is about what's going inside, going on inside the writer's head, right? Uh, this book I'm writing now is called Writing to be Understood, and it's about what's going on in the reader's head when you're trying to explain a complicated topic or write about something ah. that's abstract. Well, yeah, I love that. So. Yeah. 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 Like the real, the buyer of the book. The buyer of the book. Because, again, you know, 
if nobody gets what you're saying, you're just not going to be successful. I mean, this all comes down to, uh, you know, to basic logic. Uh, and yet yeah. when we write, we get so caught up, especially if we're writing about something, you know, writing about technology or science, we get so caught up in the, the words and the subject that we forget the most, the other important part of the equation, which is the reader. Well, don't you see the, but the, but where, where I see a lot of books get in trouble is the author forgets that they are writing for the, the buyer, the consumer, the user of mm-hmm. the book. Um, and they often fail to remember that they may not know your 40 years that brought you to the party to have all this expertise. They didn't travel that path with you. So they don't have some of the natural stuff you just intuitively know, or it's ingrained yeah. in your DNA. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a phrase for that, which is called the curse of knowledge, right? Which is that it's really hard for us to forget. I mean, to remember what it was like to not know the things that we know. Um, you know, so once we know a word or once we know a field, it's really hard for us to, to get outside of our own heads and into the perspective of someone who doesn't bring, you know, our life experience to it. Um, and we need to do that as authors, you know, especially nonfiction. This is maybe very true of nonfiction. Uh, in the development and the content development and deciding what to include and what not to include and in the revision and editing process. I mean, editors and coaches and all those people, because they are outside of your own head, can also help you defeat that curse of knowledge. Well, and that's also, Anne, I mean, I call that sometimes you become the info beast and you yeah. decide you've got to tell them everything and no, you don't. No, 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 that's no, right. you don't. Don't. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, sometimes we're just so excited about our topics. We want to share yeah. everything. Look at all this cool stuff I know where I found out. And, you know, uh, the, the real question is why is the reader going to care? Is this serving the reader or is it serving you? You know, and that's an important distinction. It's a huge distinction. And it's uh, the more clarity that an author has in this writing process and also the evolution to the marketing process, the more successful they'll be, I think. Definitely. Definitely. So, yeah. So let's talk about your process um, a, a little bit and that, that, uh, it, it, well, a lot of processes end up sticking people even more or they feel that this zaps their creativity. So yeah, talk about that a little bit, would you? Yeah, let me be really clear up front is that I'm not one of these, you know, process for process sake kind of people. You know, if somebody gives me a list of this is how we always do it, I'm probably going to rebel against it. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say, no, I, I could probably do a better way. So the last thing I want to do is tell anybody what their writing process should be or what their book creation process should be because um, it's kind of personal what works for you and what doesn't. However... However, you know, as you, as you, you know, talk about the process of writing a book is so long often, unless you're like you and you, you get it done maybe in your draft in a week, which I'm massively impressed. But, but <laughs> the process of writing a book from its inception to its getting out there, it's a long haul. And there's all sorts of opportunities for all of our kind of worst attributes to rear their heads, like impatience or laziness and procrastination or losing heart or, you know, I mean, there's, I, I, you know, I wonder how many wonderful books are out there or not out there in the world because we couldn't take them to the finish line, you know? Oh, I bet. Um, um, there, right? There's a lot. Yep. Yeah. There, so yeah, having, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. So that's why, you know, I think if you go through and you really try to understand the, the writing process that works for you best, then that is something to hold on to, to carry you through that long process of getting the book out. You can have faith in your process. Once you understand your process, you can have faith in it and, you know, write it through the long haul of putting a book together. Mm -hmm. Well, Um, you know, and and to confess to everyone, when I say I wrote a book in a week, um, I'm a blitz writer. I mean, when I go, I, I, I do deep dive. I mean, I play games with myself. Like, if you finish this chapter, you get to go pee. Literally, I've yeah. done that. <laughs> um, that or, or you finish this chapter, you get a reward. You get a whole bag of M and M's, by the way. And I gained ten pounds on that book when I did that one. But the but the <laughs> other 
the the other thing is though um for people like me we're doing stuff in our head all the time it's it's being formulated as you literally go through and you may make little scribble notes or i actually use a a 30 day expandable file where i've already segmented ideas that i want and i just drop it in drop it in and then let it go and then when i'm ready to write everything else is blocked off and that's how i can do it but that's my yeah. process oh. and i think what you're saying is so important because not everyone's process is the same no but there's a there's a you know what you got out there is another the issue right there we need two words we need a word for writing, which is I'm sitting down and putting words on paper, and we need a writing for this whole thing. Um, you know, your writing process begins before that week when you're gathering ideas, oh, yeah. incubating ideas. You're doing things that don't look like writing to the outside world, Absolutely. but you are, you, are, you are working on your book. So when people ask me, how long did it take you to write your book? I don't know how to answer that because do I count? The time I spent reading other book and taking notes, reading other books and taking notes. Do I count yeah. the time I spent on the rowing machine at the gym, gestating, incubating those ideas and thinking, oh, here's an interesting thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, That's but you're all right. part of it. And you're absolutely right. That's part of the process. Um, yeah. And you go, you know, you, you go wrong. You've got all this stuff going. Um, with it. And I think that everyone needs to recognize it. All right. We have one minute till our first break, but is there, what can we do to set up to go into it and we can get more into detail if that's appropriate? Sure. Well, I think um, I I want you to think about uh, splitting the writing into all these different parts, the things Mm -hmm. that you see and you don't. And think Mm -hmm. about the fact that the kind of writing you're doing when you're incubating an idea or mulling it over while you're driving that's a very different set of mental processes than the ones that you use when you're writing a first draft or when you're revising. So just think no about question. the fact that you've got different sets of processes you need to bring into play. Mm-hmm. And and that's and I, I think that creates actually a fuller book in a lot of ways. So in in what Anne's talking about as we as we step into the first break here is there's the gathering. Think of it as the gathering as you bring it together before you get into the writing of the words. That's a huge difference. We'll be right back. It's Author You, your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another, Author You will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good with it. If you already have a book out, you'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. If you're a hobbyist or a casual author, it's not. Join Author U today through its website at authoru.org. Follow Author U on Twitter at Author U and on Facebook at Author U, where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily. Author U, where the author goes to become seriously successful. Impressions are everything in the world of book publishing. Whether your book is an ebook, a print version, or both, your book cover needs to pop, sizzle, and sparkle to immediately capture the attention of your audience. And your book's interior needs to be just as dynamic and reflect the professionalism your readers demand. Nick Selinger of NZ Graphics has won numerous national and international book awards for his cover designs and interior layouts. With over 20 years of experience in graphic design, he knows what it takes to create award-winning books and the many promotional pieces that authors need, such as posters, banners, postcards, one-sheets, 
business cards, logos, and more. Visit ncgraphics.com and see what authors and publishers have to say about their award-winning books and how NZ Graphics can make your book the success it was meant to be. That's nzgraphics.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with us is Ann Janzar. She is the author um, working on her fourth book, um, but she's an expert in the art and the craft of writing, of, of getting it out, of dealing with the process, and that. And, and we're just getting into it. And I think what was really important, she did the separation uh, that a lot of times people are able just to sit down in front of paper and God, the ideas flow. Um, and other times there's a whole gathering that goes on. So, and let's, let's come back and kiss that a little bit before we jump forward. Definitely. Great. So if you think about, um, you know, writing, there's, there's really two different mindsets that you need to be able to apply to be a successful author. And this applies to marketing, book marketing as well, but we're, we're just mm-hmm. going to stick with, with writing right now. Right. right. That's fine. So one is. One is creativity, right? It, we need to be able to pull ideas, interesting ideas, thoughts. Even if you're writing a nonfiction, you're creative, creative. thinking of analogies and metaphors and stories. Um, and creative thinking is uh, really a sort of linear, non-linear, associative thinking. Uh, it's when our minds are just kind of rattling around in the attic and looking for related things. Um, it's not a it's not something it doesn't often feel like something we're intentionally controlling right even though we we can set up the environment for it but it doesn't seem like we can force creativity so one mindset is the creative part and one is the disciplined focused uh linear thinking part and that's the part that says i've i've got my schedule i've got my deadline here's my outline i'm going to work from this period to this period every day that's a different that's what we think of when we think of focusing on our writing we're just getting in that mindset Mm -hmm. so a successful author i mean to be successful in creating a book um and multiple books and writing you need to be able to get these two different things going on within your head these two different mental processes to work together and to know when to call on one and when to call on the other and how to set up the conditions for each one to do their bit when you need it does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so writing, you know, I, I like to think of it as sort of an inner, it, like, you know, soccer players passing the ball back and forth. When you're brainstorming and, and incubating an idea, you're trying to, in, you know, invite the creative part of yourself, which I call my inner muse, <laughs> to do the work. When you sit down to outline, you need that, that disciplined person, the analytical thought person. This, I call it my inner scribe. Mm-hmm. And when you're drafting, when you're in that moment of writing your draft, uh, that's a very delicate balance because you need both of them there. You know, the creative person giving you the words, the disciplined person keeping you there writing and not going to Facebook and not you – know, because the creative one, because it's an associative thinker, is very easily distracted. It's, it's ready to move on to, oh, there's an interesting connection. You know, that's that's what you call the swirl factor, right? That's, that part of your – is in always looking around for something different and the scribe or the linear thinking part is the one that has to keep you on task. If you're actually going to finish and publish your book. Mm -hmm. And, and that is what you have to do. And what about, um, what about self, whether it's a self-imposed deadline or going through deadlines? I mean, I seem to work well with deadlines, but I know that people, others, you know, think, Oh my God, no, I can't have a deadline. I've got to be open-ended. So what works best? I think, you know, most of us need some kind of deadline. Uh, If nothing else, then to, you know, if we give everything over to the creative muse, you know, and I know writers who are like that, and they tell me they have five unfinished books. (laughs) So I think that's telling you something. Well, that's when I say, gee, I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Right. 
creativity alone is not going to get you to the finish line, right? And a deadline does give you some, you know, I, I am constantly giving myself deadlines. Now, I do sometimes, I am also trying to be compassionate with myself. So if they need to slide, they slide, right? I mean, if as an indie author, I can do that. Um, but the deadline really does help uh, keep things, you know, like I said, you need both of these parts, and the, the deadline is what engages that planning and mm-hmm. self-disciplined part of yourself to do the work. Mm-hmm. So is it, this is the, is the is part of that planning? Is that inner? Is that like your inner game you're working on? Or um, is that something you put on a, on a board, a, fl- a, a sheet that you can visually see? Uh, well, for me, I mean, I think everyone approaches planning differently. I mean, I know people mm-hmm. who do, yeah, I know people who write from spreadsheets uh, and other people who use lots of sticky notes. And for me, I use sort of monthly deadlines or weekly, you know, by this time I want to have this set of things outlined and I'm going to finish the research or I'm going to have these first drafts done. Um, you know, it's, it's planning is however you make it, but, uh, but you do sometimes need to just do that nose down uh, sprint to um, to get it going. And the thing I notice when I really start diving deep, say I'm going to be super disciplined and just delve into this all month, then the creative part of myself jumps up. It's like, okay, you really want more ideas. I'm going to keep coming up with more ideas. So it doesn't have to having a deadline doesn't have to shut down your creativity. It can actually uh, help spur it because as you keep going and keep writing and keep struggling, uh, when you step away and do something else, your brain keeps working on it. This is, uh, psychologists call this the incubation effect. If you struggle with something and then you walk away from a bit, parts of your brain keep going on it. So it's yep. like a, I like to think of it as a bonus little task rabbit in my brain that's working when I'm not. Well, you know, I, I'm a sticky note girl. And um, okay. and I do wall maps with sticky notes, but I actually always carry some in a wallet, in my purse, in my pocket, because I, I actually am a true believer. You walk away, but the brain has still got stuff going on here. And sometimes yeah. that aha drops in. Or I, I tell you, I have been in movies, um, and I can't even remember what the line was, but I was seeing... Uh, the uh, I, I think the title was something like the Amazing Benjamin Button, and it's about the the baby that was born as an old man. Brad Pitt was in, and he reverses back into an infant. Uh, yeah, you know th- that that kind of deal. And there was some line in there that was one of those. Oh my God, this is the line I've been looking for. This, you know, that kind of ah. thing. And I and I think that that if you're open to that kind of thing, um, all around us. Those little nuggets can drop in, but the problem is they drop out right away too. And you've got yeah. to you've got to have some method. Whether you re- get out your phone and record it and send yourself an email, or you on your notes or something, um, that you've got to be able to capture those babies. Otherwise, they're gone. Definitely. And actually, so so I set up my personal writing process in a way to intentionally create the situation in which these things happen. Uh, as you said, they often happen at like convenient times, like when you're in the middle yes. of a dark movie theater or in the shower. Exactly. Or, you know, right? It's like, yes. really? This is the time I'm going to get this great idea. <laughs> but, that's, but that is how those mental processes, your inner muse works. It does it when yeah. your mind is in a state of not focusing on the, on the writing project, but focusing on something else. Mm-hmm. And the little background processes find a connection and go, oh, bing, bing, you know, here's the mm-hmm. line. For your mm-hmm. that you're looking for, um, so yeah, mm-hmm. I you know carry a notebook, um, uh, maybe even make a little voice recording. You might be able to get mm-hmm. more context around it with mm-hmm. that. Then because sometimes I'll scribble down a couple words and I'm like, you know, a few hours later, huh? I wonder what that meant. <laughs> you know? Oh, I've done that too. Dang it, yep. it, seems, it seems so great at the time. So maybe mm-hmm. a voice recording. Um, maybe try to remember what you were doing when you had that idea to trigger, mm-hmm. you know, so you can get a fuller recollection of it. But mm-hmm. that's why, you know, and I'm sure that you recommend to people, um, the one thing that I do recommend to and almost anybody is to have some kind of a daily writing practice. You don't have to be writing on a book. You can be writing in a writing journal, but capturing these ideas, because even if you don't have the idea, the fact 
that you have trained yourself to every day get up there and write 750 words in something means that, one, you're priming your brain to keep coming up with ideas, and two, you never have to wait too long to process those ideas that you get, those little insights that you get what that if you they're, want to do something with. You know, and what if you, like for me, I mean, I'm going to use me for example. Maybe that's not a good example. I, I write all the time, but it's not always connected with the book. Um, right. I mean, you know, I have a couple of blogs I have to do every week. I've got, you know, I've, I've got an easing I have to write every week. Uh, and I'm putting together copy for webinars. I have social media copy um, yep. that yep. I have to whip out all the time uh, yep. for for webinars and things we do. Do, does it have to be this writing you do every day? Does it have to be connected with the project? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I just I just have I just make a commitment to myself to do something every day, even if it's just writing about random stuff that happened to me you know it's great it's to get there almost to have that free writing I'm going to do this every day um so if I'm just in the research phase of a project or don't really have Mm -hmm. sometimes I just feel like writing about you know what what the morning felt like or what I feel like in my life I mean I I am one of those people who doesn't really always know what she thinks until she writes about it and Mm -hmm. then you know so writing is a is a part Writing is a, a way of um, thinking deeply in a world that is otherwise hard to have time for deep thought, right? Ah, uh, deep I mean, thoughts, yeah. Deep thought. And writing mm-hmm. gives us something to do that engages deep thought that we don't, mm-hmm. you know, we mm-hmm. don't have that much. Otherwise, I'm not just sitting around pondering that much of the day. Writing yeah. is my chance to do that. So. Yeah. All right. So I, I think that one of the nuggets here for everyone listening is, that even if you're not working, what I've heard Anne say, if, if you're not working on your specific book project, as long as you're, it, it's like playing, it, it, whether it's golf or sports or tennis, you're keeping those muscles in play. They're, they're in action. The brain is moving. The hand is moving. The, the, you're clicking across. You've got things in action. Um, and so you're, you're, you're always, you're never out of the game. You're always in it in some methodology. Does that make sense, Anne? Yes, yes, exactly. That's when you put it beautifully. All right. So we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the cognitive science angle. is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Want to publish like a pro today? Well, then take a look at Ingram Spark, the only publishing platform that offers print and ebook services through a single source. Upload, edit, and manage titles all in one place. Take more control of printing costs with print on demand and reach even more readers through one of the world's most extensive distribution networks. Built by independent publishers for independent publishers, Ingram Spark has everything you need to maximize your book's potential. Color printing, ebook distribution, print on demand, global reach, and more. Start publishing with Ingram Spark today and see just how far your titles will go tomorrow. That's IngramSpark.com. Many of us have dreamed of writing a book. Some of us even have. Then the hard work starts. You'll need an editor. Who will design the cover or typeset the pages? Who will format the ebook? If you're a business owner, consultant, or coach with a serious message and expertise to share, the team of experts at 1106 Design can guide you through the maze. They've helped more than a thousand authors create top quality books and avoid the not so reputable self publishing companies. Learn more at 1106design.com. Then call Michelle at 602 866 1106 Design. Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972. They believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. 
They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing questions. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Guide to Book Publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All righty, we're back. We're talking about the, the art, the art and the craft of writing. We're kissing both fiction and nonfiction. I mean, we're not talking about the character development. We're not talking about the arcing. We're talking about the process and keeping those creativity juices going. And with us is Ann Janzar. She is an author herself. She's a best-known, multi-winning author of the writer's process and the workplace writer's process. And um, and we're really, I, I kind of kissed on a phrase called the cognitive science angle. So, Anne, if you'll come back to that and, and just kind of expand it, because I, I know that we were talking, we were skirting around that in our last, in the last segment a bit. Yes. So, yeah, you can tell I'm interested in psychology and cognitive mm-hmm. science, and that yeah. it infuses um, the writer's process and infuses you know everything I write at this point. Um, because I started, you know, I, I always thought my own writing things were so strange, and then I started reading the research about creativity and the research about flow and the research about uh, uh, incubation. And I thought, oh, really what I'm doing is totally normal. It's There's psychological reasons why this works, and it's probably every writer does this. And that was really the insight mm-hmm. that uh, led to the writer's process. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, you know, I think there's so much that writers can learn from a reading of what's going on, especially about, you know, creativity and, and about flow, which is, you know, that is sort of the dream ideal state of writers. That's, that's what we picture, you know, being is absorbed like, in our writing and losing track of time. and the words ah, flowing so forth, that, right? Okay, so the flow is when you're in the zone. Is that it? In the zone, exactly. In the zone. Mm-hmm. There's a uh, psychologist called Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. I think I just mangled his name. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he wrote a book called Flow, and he's researched this state. And it's when you lose track of time and you're, the work – the work is rewarding in and of itself and you're just totally absorbed in it. Right. And that is really the ideal state. That's what we all want Mm -hmm. um, for anything we do, but certainly for writing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so he, the interesting thing for writers, and I, this is kind of the nugget that I took away from this is that he identified, you know, seven attributes of a state of flow and and you need these. Oh, can you go through those for us? Yeah, no, I don't have them in front of me. I have to grab a book. But um, one of them is, you know, a lack of distraction, a focus on the work itself, work that is challenging enough but not way beyond your your capabilities, Um, work that provides feedback in and of itself, Um, losing track of time. I'm doing pretty well remembering these. (laughs) Um, And then the, the last two I want to get into because they're really important. One is a lack of self-awareness. You're not focused on yourself. And one is a lack of fear. 
a lack of fear. So those, as a writer, how do you set yourself up for flow? Well, one thing is, you know, you, you do work that's within your bounds, but is a challenge to you. You try to get in a situation where you can focus on the work and you don't have distractions. But you also turn down that self-criticism and the fear of what it's going to be, how it's going to turn out. So for me, this means when you're writing, when you're drafting and trying to just get the words out, you need to not be revising and polishing. You mm -hmm. need to put that away for later and just focus on getting the words out. Even as they go by and you say, this is, I, I just use the passive voice for three sentences in a row, or, you know, big is the best adjective I can come up with. It doesn't matter. You just keep going. Make a note of something you're going to fix. Don't be critical. Just get the ideas down in the, in the, as fluidly as you can. The more you set yourself up for a state of flow, the greater chances you're going to have of achieving that. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, uh, I have a client I'm writing with every other Friday. He comes in for four hours and we just write together. And he does cool. the, uh, you know, we're, just, we're side by side in comfortable chairs. And actually, he's, he's turned it over to me. It's now my time to wordsmith it. And mm -hmm. that he, he's, I, I've moved him from a total boring, oh my God, it looked like a dissertation, Anne. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was yeah. awful. Um, deal because he had been trained in the academic field. That's that's all he really yeah. knew, and I, and I understood that. But that I had to say, can we just have a conversation? So I said, and I asked him, is this a dissert? Was this what is this? How could you have a biography that's twenty pages? For God's sakes! <laughs> um, and so I threw the whole thing away. Literally, I went over to my trash can and threw his entire manuscript away. And I said, we're starting over. And yeah. and I said, let's just talk. And doing that. Tell me a story. Talk. Tell me where we're going. Um, and we created this deal that we turned in his his writing that he was just struggling for and he couldn't communicate because that's not how he wanted to communicate into yeah. it became fun for him. So, yeah. you know, was it really tight when it came to me, the next, the, the new stuff? No, but it was workable. All of it became workable that I could yep. play with and, and, and with him here, I said, you know, does this sound like you? Does it feel like you tell me more about this, that he would always leave with a finished. I would do the finishing side. I think, so what you're just saying here is that when you get into too much revising, I think it plugs up the creativity actually. Um, and it, it does. does stop the flow. It does. I mean, imagine for a moment that you were someone who, you know, you, you decided you were going to bring a nice gift to your neighbor every day. So you bake some cookies one day and they say, oh, well, you know, I don't eat gluten. And then you bring them flowers the next day. They're like, oh, I hate pink. And you bring, you know, you bring them a chocolate the next day. It's like, you know, I'm gaining a little weight. I really don't want to, you know, at some point you're going to stop bringing gifts because heck with it, right? You know, <laughs> that mm -hmm. is what your creative person, your creative side feels like if everything it, it you know, it, it contributes a shot down for some random reason, right? That's, that part of your brain is going to just pack up and go when you're writing if you're constantly uh, criticizing it. So you're now, sabotaging it. Self-criticism then becomes sabotaging. It does. And you're, you're giving that inner critic way too much power. You, you, need, you need that critical eye in the revision phase and the editing phase, but you do not need it in the drafting phase. You know, that's, yeah. And well, interesting, I, I love I your think story. That's important. Yep, that's a nugget, everyone. That's a nugget. Understand that. Because I see it all the time that people want to tweak and tweak and tweak instead of just getting it done, moving it out, and then coming back and starting the tweaking process. Right. And so so that's a great example of having and relying on your writing process. You're writing it. You see that what's coming out is kind of ugly and crappy and has gaps and, and bad words. It doesn't matter because you have faith in this process. You know that there's a revision step to come. That gives you permission to just keep going and generating the ideas. Having faith in your process helps you get through this. And I love what you talk about with this writing for this guy because, mm -hmm. you know, we are natural communicators. As, as human beings, we are, we are primed to do this. 
And by sitting there with him, in a way, you gave him an audience, a person to talk to. When we don't picture our reader, we can get stuck in academic writing or things that just wander off. But when we're talking to someone, we would never talk that way. We're more to the point, um, more clear. We, we bring our readers' context and needs into view. So another way to get in the flow of writing is to picture the person that you're writing for. You get out of your own head and into the needs of somebody else. It's going to make you more effective. Mm-hmm. And and I just going back to to my client that when we started this process, I it must have been in February. We're actually going to have his book done next month. Oh, it'll that's be great. It'll be totally done, and that's just working together every other week. And then he, you know, he has a week off to get together what he's going to bring in. So, I, you know, this is where, for all of you, that sometimes you may need someone like me or an Anne to to be that bounce-back person who, number one, will right. give your right. inner self permission to write crappy. I love that, Anne. Mm-hmm. I think that's just a great phrase. Um, to write <laughs> crappy, because writing crappy can always be fixed. And And I've always had yeah. to tell some of my clients, you know, you have great ideas. You know, you are the author. Your writing sucks. Just get it here so we can get it fixed up. That's all you have to do. <laughs> yep. So, yep. So. Yeah, you can revise. You can revise. You yeah. know, have faith in revision. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, oh, that's a great phrase. Have faith in revision. All right. So, and we've got one more minute um, until our final break, if you can believe it. But I, wow. I'd like to go through um, other steps in the the whole flow process. But also, let's get into some of the most common mistakes. I think it's always really and 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 some of the rectifying that they can do. I know we've kissed on a few of them, but maybe we can kind of put them in. You know, almost a one, two, three. Here's a, here's the biggest single mistake I see uh, okay. authors. And also, th- there's newbie authors, but also there's some of us who are long in the tooth. We still make the same mistakes. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I opened the writer's process with a riff on that Dostoevsky quote about, you know, happy families are all the same, but unhappy families are the interesting ones. I think that <laughs> happy writers. Right? Hold on to that I, thought. I We're going to take a break. Hold on to that thought. And okay. we'll come back with happy writers. It's author you, your guide to book publishing. <laughs> is your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles and we'll be right back with more great information right after these the book shepherding concept is simple the publishing world is changing and so must you You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd. If you want to create a book with no regrets, give her a call today, 303-885-2207. That's 303-885-2207 or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at My Book Shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd.
One of the most important decisions you will ever make is your choice for printing your book. You are choosing a company which will be responsible for guiding you through the process and printing your book at a level of quality and detail that embraces your personal and creative needs. You want to choose a company that when your book finally arrives, you are delighted and ready to move on to the next level and one that is customer focused. Choose King Printing Company and Addy Books to be that company that brings you to the next level. Go to kingprinting.com or call 978-458-2345 and ask for Tom Campbell. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR, perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types including side sewing we provide warehousing kitting distribution inventory management a new print on demand facility streaming browser based ebooks and bookstore call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project you can also visit our website at www.tps1.com Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryle. All right, with me in my last segment today is Ann Janzar, and we're talking about really how to be a really powerful writer who does books and sells them, kind of all together as you're bringing that. And and we, this whole idea of flow uh, that she started on on the last segment of, of getting into the writing zone and staying there. And I think one of the, my takeaways was that there is an art to not self-sabotaging yourself here. And it is so easy to do that. And those of you who work and write primarily out of your home, you've got to be really careful here. So, Anne, do you want to kiss on that just a little bit of some of the, the, the barriers that you can run into? Sure. So when it comes to the writing itself, um, yeah, I mean, there's, about 8 million distractions at any given moment, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I, when I'm actually in the phase of writing, I uh, put myself actually in a different place, even working in the home. I have home office, but I go to like a, I take a little laptop, which has nothing else on it except Word and, and some, you know, I keep maybe the Merriam-Webster online dictionary or something open in the background. And I mm-hmm. write there. So I'm, I'm signaling to myself that in this time period, I'm not distractible. I'm just working on the writing, not something else. So that's one way to actually sort of reinforce the zone of the cone of silence, right? The the zone of indistractability um, is to set aside a certain time of day or a certain place. Um, When I'm revising, sometimes I go to my kitchen table because it's not in the office at all and just focus on revising. Um, and that helps to, to eliminate the distractions. Oh, um, I have, I, you know what I do? I, sometimes I listen to opera when I'm revising. Um, yes, there you go. Yeah. That me, the flow, the flow of the music and the words and, and the passion. I mean, literally, you can feel the passion. Sometimes. Yes. Um, yeah. that, yeah. and, and the doors close. This is the time no one's allowed to come in. That, right. It, it, it is amazing what sometimes comes out. <laughs> I, yes, I have yes. no, I have no idea what these people are saying, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it helps probably if it's in a foreign language as opposed to in English, which would be distracting that part of your. Ooh, what'd you say? <laughs> mm-hmm. That part of your brain. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one thing. I mean, we 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 sabotage ourselves by being distracted. We sabotage ourselves by uh, feeling doubt. 
saying, who am I to write about this thing? Uh, that, you know, we've all heard about the imposter syndrome, which, you know, is that sense that you're a, you're a fraud and you shouldn't be doing this. And it tends to attack people who are, you know, it, it gets almost everybody um, at some point. And the more, even if you're, you know, clearly highly qualified to be writing about the thing you're writing about, you're going to sometimes feel like an imposter. Um, so it's important to know that and say, okay, you know, I got that. Everybody does. Here it is again. I'm going to keep going. Um, and we sabotage ourselves through uh, perfectionism, uh, which can, if we let it creep in during the drafting phase, it's that same issue of I'm going to polish every word before I move on. Um, and that can, you know, the other thing about revising while you're drafting, so there's mm-hmm. the, the mental process that we talked about before, mm-hmm. but there's a very practical reason also not to do that, which is that you become too attached, too invested in those words. Yeah. Now, when you go to revise and mm-hmm. you look at it and you say, ha, this doesn't fit, <laughs> right? This chapter or this section doesn't really serve the reader. What am I going to do? If I'm really throw invested it out. in it, throw it out. <laughs> it's going to feel so painful to throw it out if I've spent all that time polishing. Or worst case, so either I'm going to just cry, right? <laughs> Uh-huh. Or I might um, I might leave it in because it's like, no, this is great stuff. I'm leaving it in. And it doesn't serve the reader. It doesn't serve uh-huh. the book. And you and I have both read plenty of books, even by well-known authors, where there's stuff in there you're thinking, why is this here? <laughs> you uh-huh. know, it's because uh-huh. they were invested in that being there, but it doesn't uh-huh. serve me. It's serving the reader. So yeah, there's I'm- a real danger. Yeah, and my suggestion to to my authors is just create a folder within your master folder and just label it old or revisit yeah. or something. Um, yeah. And it, it just move it out, get it out of there so you yeah. can see it. And then and then you know maybe it belongs in another book. Maybe that's right. next. Right. I I have a folder a file like that, and I call it stuff that needs a new home. So I'm not killing it. I'm just giving it and relocating it somewhere. <laughs> and I think exactly. some of it's going to be blog posts. But I cut mm-hmm. like 10,000 words out of the draft of my most recent book. And when I realized it was uh, a different book or a digression, I'm going to make blog posts from it. I use some, you know, I'm, I'm going to use different, I'll use it for different things. I'm not killing it. I'm simply remove, relocating yeah. it. It's a repurpose. And and, and yeah. I think that that's the beauty, you know. And I wanted you to kiss on um, the the ideal, especially in nonfiction, of repetition on on it. Yes. Um, and that we I've read some people's. I mean, I've had it. Gee, you you said this. We're we're on chapter ten or whatever. You said this back in chapter two. Well, is there a reason right. why it should be repeated? I mean, is there is right. there any right. hard rules on this, or is there no rules? So, you know, I've just been working on this book about nonfiction writing, and I've interviewed a bunch of authors about it, Mm -hmm. and they all Mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm surprised by how often I have to repeat, or I'm very intentional in repetition. Yes. But, you know, as, as, and I think that there are reasons to do it. Um, One author says, you know, I recognize that when someone's reading this chapter, they may be just kind of glazing over it, so maybe it doesn't sink in the first time, or... Mm -hmm. In nonfiction books, people often read a couple chapters and come back a few weeks later and read another chapter, right? So mm-hmm. they may not remember what you said. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mm-hmm. think that re- repeating with intention, but there are ways to do that without sounding like the boring person who's repeating themselves all the time. Well, you say it a different time. way, for sure, yeah. You say it a different way. Uh, you repeat with a different um, kind of value. You'd like, well, why don't you spin a story that illustrates the point, gives you permission to summarize the repetition in this, you know. You repeat with story. You repeat with data. Um, and as, and actually, you know, as writers, we have something that, uh, like, speakers don't have, which is we can repeat in different uh, structural elements, like headings and chapter summaries and things like that that don't seem like they're repetition. They're actually added value but they repeat your key mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. All right. So, so it's and, important. you know, there, I think it is really important because sometimes you're right. That it gets get glazed over. They weren't ready to absorb it. You just introduced it. And then you, you introduce and then reinforce. I think maybe that's the way to look at it. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, you know, you may, and maybe one person gets it the way you phrased it the first time and another person gets it when you provide a really good analogy later because they just think differently. They need a different kind of aha moment to get what you're saying or to remember it. That that's a that's a great great idea. I mean, and the thing is, different personalities, different styles, and they didn't hear it when you gave this example, but they totally see it when you gave the other example. So you exactly. can bring it about that way. So, Anne, we have about two and a half minutes left. What are the most common mistakes you see in just writing um, in general? Yeah, I, you know, the most common thing is that people think of writing as one thing. I'm going to sit down at the desk and write something brilliant, and you know. This plagues college students, this plagues people in the workplace, this plagues everybody, and, and authors. I'm going to sit down and write a book. Uh, we talk about that, you know, writing is much bigger than just that time that you're putting the words down on paper. So if you break it apart, I'm going to do some research or some brainstorming. I'm going to let the ideas incubate. I'm going to outline. Mm-hmm. I'm going to draft. I'm going to revise. I'm going to polish. Mm-hmm. That's what you do. You don't say, I'm going to sit down in one spell and bring all these different cognitive processes brilliantly and come out with something wonderful. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. No. And, and I, I, I totally agree with you on that. I know that my, my heart book, which was called when God says no, um, opens on the death of my 19 year old son with a, you know, with an awful accident and 10 of his friends were involved and what we had to do. It took me five years before I could write anything on that. That when I am taking a writing retreat at the end of of uh, June of this year, I'm taking that book with me to gut it and do a full oh, revision. Yeah. And I have been, Sorry. you know, how many years I've been diddling with this in my head that what I wanted to yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's the process. <laughs> it's yeah. the process. That's just the right. process. <laughs> All right. So it's not just one thing. That's that's number one. And is there anything else? Is there like a number two? And then we're going to close up here. Um, you know, number two is, I think, uh, just letting doubts uh, derail you, you know, keep you from writing in the first place. You know, I spent years thinking I have nothing to say in a book until finally it's like, mm-hmm. well, no, I do have something to say. Um, so letting doubts derail you uh, and I, I think that's the other biggest thing I see. That's people, a big one. Um, yeah, exactly. One, you know. Well, yeah. Anne, thank you so much. We're going to have you back again, and we're going to talk about some of those cognitive things people can do with marketing, I think, um, in yeah, their writing and pushing that way. All right, so everyone, I'm going to encourage you to follow Anne um, and subscribe to her blog. You can find her at Anne Janzar. It's A-N-N-E-J-A-N-Z, as in zebra, E-R.com. Anne, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see everyone next week. a part of your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles each 